So again, creating the project. Hello, hello. Creating the project, Visual Studio, empty project. Next, I know these things from IPC and OP244. I don't want to uh, go there, but uh, the little things that, uh, uh, that we need to do to make sure everything works properly. So, 03, 03 uh, September, September 14th, create. And then after that, make sure that you are in the project uh, properties and you set the standards to uh, 17 or 20, okay? Apply, okay, and then you start, okay? The standards has to be set to that because there are like a couple of things, the rest of the stuff are working on 14, but there are a couple of things that when we get to, it's gotta be C++ 17 and 20, uh, we don't wanna, uh, um, trying to uh, look for things that uh, are not there. So let me prepare my cheat sheet over here. Uh, there we go. Again, my apologies for the door being locked. Um, Every time there is something. Let me pause recording while I'm... All right, so we're going to kind of fill in the blanks, continue with uh, uh, little things that you need to know about uh, C++ that kind of did not, we did not put emphasis on it too much in OP244. Now uh, we're going to get deeper in C++, so we, know, we need to know all these things. So um, um, let me start up. I'm going to create a And oh, uh, using namespace SVD. All right. Uh, first thing first, uh, there is something that I need to mention that uh, I've seen people uh, do things without, that, but without knowing they're affecting it like an invisible bug in their application. So, um, I've seen lots of people like they are creating variables. So int A, int B, int C, we have all these things. First, uh, and remember uh, one of the coding rules in my class, you, you, you can't say int A comma B comma C, okay? I want comments in front of every single thing that you're doing. So. Uh, unless you put the comma and then you go to the next line, okay? Uh, every variable that you have must have its own definition. It's just uh, uh, some nerdish thing that I do, so don't worry about it, okay? So what I'm saying is that, uh, let's say I want to set this thing to number 17. That's very fine and good. Uh, but let's say the value that you are putting over there cannot be more than three digits. And as a tidy, person that you, you are, you want to em put emphasis on that, then you're going to say, okay, to, to put emphasis that this is three digits, I'm going to put 013 instead, okay? Doing so, you created a huge bug in your application uh, that um, it's, uh, if you don't know what literal integers are, uh, it's going to cause trouble. You know what is the literal uh, integer for hexadecimals are. So if I wanted to put an hexadecimal 17, it's 0x17, correct? So it's not 17, actually it's 116 and 7, right? Uh, A is 110 and 7. And to our surprise, if you start a number with 0, you are actually in base 8. So now you have over there, you have 18 and 17. 
So 017 is not 17 in a cool way. It is 17 in oct base. Careful. Okay? So printing all these things, you'll see that the values are completely different. So that's something that I needed to mention. Compile and run. As you see, the first one is actually 17, the second one is 15, and the third one is 23, okay? Um, you've got to be careful about that, all right? Everybody's okay with this? You understand this? Okay, so as a professional C++ programmer, you should always go through the definition of literal values and see how you have to uh, use them. It's very important, okay? So let's call this one a, a careful with base eight dot cpp. That's that one. As I told you, we are going through uh, uh, many different things. Um, well, anybody knows what is size off? Size off? Have you heard of, of, of uh, size off? It, it gives you the size of whatever you put in front of it, right? Just be aware that size of is not a function. Size of is actually an operator. Size of is like you're saying minus five, not B, size of A. So size of is within the uh, operator structure of C++. So um, for example, um, let's, uh, have a series of structures over here and see actually how we can actually deal with them with it, understand what their sizes are. So let's say I have a structure for coordinate somewhere and I have a double, double X and Y over there and I have another coordinate and double X and Y long, long value and the character ID. I wanna just set them and uh, have uh, uh, to see what they're gonna look like. Um, just showing what the, the size of these things are, we can do something like this. I can actually say C out, something like, uh, I'm gonna say size off chord, and in here it's gonna be size off uh, chord, okay? That's, that means any uh, class that is made up of coordination, a structure class, potatoes, potatoes, um, that actually tells, uh, uh, it has a size as total, and you guess, uh, what would you guess the size would be of this thing? What would be the size of chord over here? What is the size of a double? What is the size of a character? Character is four, no, character is one. Depends what type of a character. So if it's Unicode, then it's going to two and four, but, but regular character that we have, like when you say CHR, it's one. What is the size of a short? Those, two, okay? It's gonna be two, because uh, short integer, right? The smallest integer possible is a character. Character is not a character. Anybody told you that we have anything called character in C language, they lied. There is no such thing as character in C language. C language has a small integer, big enough to hold the ASCII code of a number. Because of that, they called that integer character. It's not a character, it's simply an integer, okay? Obviously, when you are showing it, through a function or an object, like you are inserting it into C out, C out sees the type is character. Instead of printing the ASCII code, it prints the shape of it. Are we clear about that? Now, short integer, two bytes. Integer, four bytes, depending on what type of a platform you're in. Integer is a very dangerous thing. It, it changes its size. Uh, on a 32-bit thing, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's four bytes. On a 16-bit platform, uh, what is a platform? When I say platform, what does it mean? Instruction, that's very technical, but what is a, what makes a platform platform? When I say a platform, what builds a platform? When I say a platform, a plat, and? So you're perfectly correct. So it is, there, there are two things. What is your machine? and what is your compiler? You may have a 64-bit structure, but you have a 32-bit compiler, or you have a 16-bit compiler. I'd have doubt that you've ever seen one 
but, but I worked with it. It used to call, be called Torvo C++, but anyways. So, so, yeah, so the combination of these two dictates what is the size of an integer. It could be four, it could be eight, depending on what it could be two, okay? And still, when you are uh, programming microcomputers, like you're programming a mouse, you're programming a keyboard, you're programming a remote control for a TV, these things may have microcomputers that the, the construct is 16-bit because they don't need much of a thing and they have like 2K of RAM. When I say 2K, I mean literally mean 2,048 bytes of RAM, okay? You can literally count it. So uh, these days, we don't have stuff like that. Like um, these days, my cell phone is more powerful, which I forgot to put it on mute. My cell phone, which is uh, in my pocket, uh, is more powerful than a supercomputer we had in uh, what, 1980s, 19, 1980s in, um, I don't know, NASA. So now you know, so now a remote control, if you get a remote control, especially those fancy schmancy one, probably they are very powerful and they have that, well, whatever. Back to the business we were talking about. Uh, when we, so that's that one, and if we are talking about long, long, that's eight bytes, right? If I have a long, 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 then it doesn't exist. We have just two longs. <laughs> There's no three. Okay, just two longs. So, so that's eight is the last one. When we are talking about uh, the floating point, uh, it's uh, a float and a double and a long double. So float is four, double is eight, and long double is, again, you have to look at the structure of the machine, some implemented in that. So that's why we have size off. Let's put it that way. That's why we have size off. If you never trust what the thing is, you actually check what the size is with your program. And therefore, when I actually run this, I'll notice that the double is actually size eight, and because of that, size of that structure, obviously, is going to be 16. Correct? Right? So, and now let's do, the, do it with the coordination ID. So, so this one is eight plus eight. That's that one. So if I actually... And by the way, you know that if I actually initiate, uh, instantiate cord, I can actually put the uh, instance name, the object name in size of. Potatoes, potatoes, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, size of extracts the type. So whatever you put over there, it's always size of the type, not the size of the, yeah. Actually, size of the type and object are the same, but hey. So if I put over here cord ID right now, and I do the exact same thing and try and see it, what do you guess the thing's gonna be? So long, long was eight, right? I have three eights, that's 24 plus one, it's 25. So let's see what is the size actually. When I run the program, it says the size is, oops, 32. Why? So we have two factors we need to think about when we are dealing with compound types. Uh, their alignment and their size, okay? What is the alignment? What is the size? The size is the size of an, op let's put it this way, the size of an object is filled with a filler to meet the size so it can be aligned in memory, okay? If the size of this thing was 25, 25, this, yeah. I don't know what is a long, long, 25. Yeah, so if I, if, I, if I had this thing as 26 characters and I made an array of it, the first one starts from uh, address zero, correct? The second one's address will be 26, right? Can a double sit at address 26? Oh, you don't know that, do you? Okay, each primitive variable must sit on an address that is the coefficient of its size. So a character can sit in any piece of memory because it's one. A short integer can only sit on an address that is coefficient of two, right? If it's an integer, it has to be coefficient of four. If it's a double, it has to be coefficient of eight. And because that thing starts with a double, it has to sit on coefficient of eight. Because of that, it expands the sides with garbage, make it so the next address is a 
coefficient of 8. So the alignment of chord ID probably is 8. I'm never going to say 100%. I'm going to check it out, OK? Or, and, and the size, uh, as you see, is expanded, so that is met. Uh, do we understand this? So when you create a structure like this, and you create like uh, 32 and uh, 25, uh, 26, there are like, lots of difference between the two, right? There's like six, seven bytes, six, seven bytes different, correct? If that's the case, and you create a million of these things in an array, then you have a million uh, multiplied by six, seven bytes that you did not uh, count for. That's huge. So you have to always be careful about these things, OK? Are we OK with this? All right, so now we're going to actually take a look and see it's not that easy. So you cannot always sit over there and do the math and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's what it is. You're scaring me, man. Yes, I'm recording. It's six, yeah, 16 minutes. <laughs> so just to show you, if you see, that means it's paused. OK, so <laughs> remind me, please. Hey, Farnat, you're not recording. OK? And on big blue button, please check, because last time I forgot to click the, put the record. I, luckily, I was backing up with this. So, so uh, I always try to put the YouTube video in the notes, because you always have access to big blue button recording by going to big blue button, right? So I'm not going to list that over there. If I don't have the YouTube video, then I'll put a link to the big blue button over there. So continuing with that, Let's see. I'm going to add two more things over here that is going to tell you that it, it, it's really tough to actually go through all these things. Um, if I actually write these two structures, test, test and test two, OK? <clears throat> both, they ha both of these have one double, one integer, and one character in them, correct? Right? Now take a look. So this one is test, not text. And this one is going to be test two. Three years later, take a look. One is 24, and the other one is 16. And in the structure, you have the exact same amount of variables, right? So. <clears throat> The, f the, the first one is written by a rookie, so it doesn't know what it is because the character is the first thing that appears in the record. They're going to put that one in a structure. And thinking and everything is good. And I'm a pro. I write it that way. My program uses how much memory less if I have a million uh, things of this in a file? Because <laughs> if, if, if you save it in a file, it's exactly as if, as if you are saving it in an array. It doesn't make any difference. You're going to have those gaps in them. So we have to be careful. What the rule is, don't try to, like, because the alignment is not met, double has to always sit on the address, on an address. So it has to f fill the beginning of the structure with seven garbage characters. So the double can always sit on an alignment of eight. See? Like you're going, what the hell? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, I'll give you a rule, uh, 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 an easy thing to go. Look at the size of the stuff that you are putting. Start with the largest one and sort it to the, to the, to the smallest one. You're going to uh, consume the least amount of memory. OK? Are we good with that? All right. Yes. Pardon me? You don't need to think about that. You think about that you're, unless you want to, I don't know, write a virus or do, ha, like implement some operating system thingy. But as a C++ programmer, remember that when you are creating a class, first of all, you know that classes, methods don't occupy any space. Methods are actions. I know how to dance. Does that make me heavier? No. Right? When you know, seriously, when you know something, it doesn't add to your volume. It's the same thing with classes. Classes, action, be and behavior, it doesn't add to their size. It's only their property, OK? Therefore, you create a class or you create a, a 
uh, a structure, all you need to do is to make sure that all the, first of all, don't put it everywhere. Don't, don't put some three properties up there and two methods and organize everything properly. Sort it properly from the biggest one to the smallest one unless you have a purpose for it and you think you want, you understand the alignment and you want to sell it in a way to do something with it. I have no idea what. But, and take advantage of the maximum space that you have. So when you are actually doing something like that, like if I create something like this, if I create something like this, then in here I'm gonna say character filler seven, in case I want to use it, right? The size is not gonna be different. I have just some extra space to, to put something in it if I want to. So if you have, if you have, if you, if you are creating something that has some extra space, maybe you want to think if you, if there is some optional property that you want to add to it in case you have the space, use it, right? Uh, so that's that. So these are important stuff. It doesn't seem like much and like in, in, in a textbook, it's like in your notes, it's like three lines. It says as I, alignment and size of, but the consequences of it is so much that I want you to know going forward. So that's why at the beginning we're gonna be a little slow when we're going, we're gonna cover the concepts faster. Yes? So if you have like a, a of mm -hmm. No. Character of 30 is the size is one. Right? The size is one, you have 30 ones. So if you are sorting them, you are putting the eight, the four, and the 31 ones. <laughs> if that's even a word, I don't know. All right, <clears throat> are we good? Are we, are we good? Okay. Well, you have to first speak very slowly and uh, loud so I can, I just had, <laughs> okay, go ahead. 13 and 14? I don't know, do it and see what, find out. <laughs> What's gonna happen? I, uh, probably it's gonna shrink four bytes, I don't know. I, I really don't know, let's try it. Because the, the integer is gonna go in that space, right? So it's gonna be just two extra bytes, well, we'll see. I think it's gonna be the same size as the other one. So you're talking about this one and this one? I don't think it makes any difference. Let's try. So now you said it, I'm gonna do it like this. Test three. And do all these things yourself at home. It's good for your health, believe me. Okay? Three, okay. There you go, remains 60, right? Because it has to still align it to the double. So the size is two doubles, it doesn't matter which, which direction it's going. All right, are we good down at this point? Right, so, so size of. In here I'm gonna say B, um, size of, dot CPP, right? Size of, yeah. All right, now let's bring this stuff from my cheat sheet so I don't have to type everything from the beginning, copy. <clears throat> so, now, what I'm doing over here is this. I'm creating uh, a regular integer, I call it A. I put something in it. I put uh, a double pointer, and I'm gonna put the address. So remember, I'm casting this thing to a double, so this becomes a double address. It means at this address, I wanna put a double. Of course, it's not gonna let me. If I do it, it's gonna crash because it's just some random <laughs> thing probably in the OS, right? But I just want to deal with the address. And I'm gonna put the exact same number as an address of an integer, and the exact same number as address of a short, and the exact same number as address of a, of a coordinate. So I have three equal, five same addresses that I am putting in different pointers, okay? And I'm gonna add one to every and each of them. So I'm gonna add one to A, then P, Q, R, and C one to each address, and this ginormous re reinterpret casts unsigned long, long that you see, I could simply say unsigned and get a warning for it. So I could, I could do this. Whoa, what is this thing with, with uh, uh, Visual Studio uh, 2022? When you highlight and type, it doesn't overwrite, see? Oh, it did this time. 
I, th I think it heard me. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna cast that P to an unsigned. So I'm gonna say it's an unsigned integer. Of course, uh, it's gonna give me a warning that what are you doing, like, you know. But that one, it just means I know what I'm doing, don't warn me. Anyways, when I run it, you will see the numbers that are gonna come up will be this. Take a look, A is added by one. He is added by eight. Q is added by 4, R is added by 2, and C is added by 20, whatever it was, the size of uh, chords by 8. By 8? No. What is size of coordination? Chord. 60? Oh, no. What did I? Anyways, uh, believe me, it's right, whatever it is, so it, it, that's the address. That's the, uh, the address that the next thing can sit in memory. Okay, so remember, uh, this is called pointer arithmetic. I think we talked about an OP244, didn't we? Did I talk about it? I think I talked about it, yeah. So remember, when you have a pointer to um, an entity, when you add one to it, the size of the entity plus alignment, the size of an alignment will be actually uh, uh, added to it, okay? The size will be added to it. And now in here, you can actually see, you can actually, uh, check to see what is the alignment of a coordinate, as you see over here. So alignment of a coordinate is that, is the address a coordinate ID can, is it coordinate or coordinate ID? It's coordinate. Uh, so alignment of coordinate is eight, alignment of a coordinate ID is eight two. They both can sit on an address that is coefficient of eight and all their properties, addresses will be perfect, okay? Um, but uh, yeah. So it does, size of and, and alignment are not the same thing. Remember that. It, alignment says where you can begin, okay? Size of says where the next one's gonna sit. Are we good? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? Uh, I, have a, I had a person that asked me on the chat, uh, it seems like it's like OP244. What is different in OP345? I think you know the difference now a little, okay? I don't know who was the person. Somebody, somebody sent me in like that. Like it seems like what you're doing, we already know in OP244. Is it anything else? And I'm like, wait for it. All right, so alignment. So that's that. <coughs> Next thing. Where do we return? Where do we return? Where does that one, two, three, four goes? Go, people. Nope. The answer was compiler, by the way. Somebody said compiler. Where, where does it go? Fantastic, back to the operating system, okay? Why, so if you are actually writing a program and end up like in writing a shell script and in that shell script you are like, how do you see, no, how do you think I check to see if you have errors in your compiler in submitter program? I compile the code, I check the return statement of the compiler from the operating system, okay? If it's not zero, it means you did some boo-boo thingy over there. Okay, so it's the same thing over here. Uh, so now if I actually compile this code, uh, I think I can make it, make this stick. Uh, rebuild, and I'm gonna go to, where do I go? Let me op first open the folder, that's the folder. Now I'm gonna copy where the folder is. Now I'm gonna copy where the folder is, copy. Yes, copy. And then I'm gonna open up the command thingy, cmd. Now I'm gonna bring it over here. And I'm gonna go D. Oh, um, I have to install that shell thingy over here so I, I keep Pressing the last. Okay, so um, CD, and I'm going to put this one over here. That's the path for the thing. X64. 
Uh, and then I have debug somewhere, I think. Yes, yeah, CD debug. And this is the, the, the executable, right? So when I execute the executable, 03-September 14, and I execute it, okay, now I'm gonna say echo. How do I bring it up? Um, let me see if I can do it. Is it better? <laughs> echo, I'm gonna say, I think, uh, one, two, three, four. Okay, in, uh, in Linux, I think it's the dollar sign. I think echo dollar sign returns this one. I don't remember exactly, but that's what it is, I think. So yeah, so you can check to see what, so uh, that's why you, you like to return stuff that means something in your program. If you ever expect your program is gonna run within series of programs through a shell program application. So you want to actually give the, and you document that thing. If the program returns zero, it's this. If program returns one, it's that. So when sh that, that shell programmer executes your program through a thing, it can uh, get an answer back of how, pro how your program ended. Are we good? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? So, okay, next. So this is D, where do we return? Can't do that, but I can do this. All right. Uh, when you are creating the find statements, it's extremely unprofessional these days to actually use the find statements, okay? Look at the defined statements I have over here. I have defining integer pointer to int pointer. So therefore, that defined statement will create an integer pointer, or that's what I think it does. And I'm going to say define first half to for int i equals 0, define the rest. And I'm going to say first half the rest do that. This program runs perfectly. And what the most stupid program can write, <laughs> because nobody knows what the heck you're doing, right? Remember, the find statement is a dumb thing. It searches your code before compilation because you are doing it with hashtag. Hashtag gets executed when? Before the code gets compiled. So before the code gets compiled, it does a search and replace, and then changes the values, and then it starts compiling. So. Of course, this is the, the, I have an extra return zero over there. Is it an extra return zero? What did I do? Oh, uh, this thing, this curly bracket over here, the, comp the, the thing doesn't understand what the heck is that, the uh, intelligence thing is, but yeah. So if I run the program, this is what I get. And take a look, this one is not a pointer actually. Because when, you, when, when this is replaced with integer pointer, you know that if I make this, if I want to have this, this asterisk, you know that it actually belongs here, right? Which means it tells, so integer, you put it beside the type because you want to em have emphasis that this is an integer pointer. And then, sadly, because of the syntax, for every other one, if you want to make it a pointer, you have to do this. That's why I always say, don't, every single thing must have its type, because these are like bad bugs that you can create. If I want to, I have to write integer pointer t, then integer pointer t. There is another way of doing it we're going to see in three seconds, but <clears throat> just be aware, okay? Are we good down to this point? All right, so careful with this thing. So don't use define unless you're using macros, okay? On what was the macro, we're going to see, okay? So, don't use define unless, pardon me? E? Okay. <clears throat> so, how can we fix that problem? There is such thing called type def. A type def is, uh, a command 
that you can issue, request the compiler to create a new type out of an already existing type. So int ptr here is not a defined statement. It will be added to C++'s dictionary as an integer pointer. It's a type now. Because of that, when I say integer ptr, p and q, they are both pointers now. Okay? So if you want to do something like that, this is your answer. This actually is the better way of doing it. Okay, so that's one of the uses of ty uh, type def. So type def is used to give already existing types new names. Are we okay with this thing? All right. So that's the solution for uh, <coughs> uh, for type def. So so I'm going to call that uh, type def instead instead of the file dot cpp okay i'm not going to you want me to execute it it's going to run trust me okay <laughs> pardon me what is the point of that all right the funny thing is that that's the exact same thing i'm going to say next why type def okay now when you are dealing with real applications these are the things that you will see Constant unsigned long long int pointer. I want you to write that every single time you want to create that type. Right? That takes three years, right? So if that's the case, uh, I simply call it constant un unsigned long long int PTR. Right? And that makes your life easier. So remember that type def can be used to shorten things, used in a very shortened and more uh, understandable way. Are we good? All right? All right. So, <laughs> so what's the point? <laughs> the point of type def. Got CPP. All right. And again, running it, uh, you know what it is. Please run it at home and, and see what it is. You know what, what's going to happen, right? Long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, when we wrote C programs, so I'm going to actually call this one, I'm going to rename that. How do I rename? To prg.c. So when we wrote C programs, we used type that for something pretty nice, actually, um, which was like this. So if I have include, uh, what was it, uh, stdio.h, right? Yeah. And so I wanted to create a, a, um, a structure for a student. So what would I do? I would write student, uh, struct student, of course, struct student. And then in here, I would write, um, I don't know, character um, name. And uh, uh, double GPA, OK? So I, I, I create a student like this. Now, of course, as you see, I actually made it wrong. I have to do it the other way, right? But eh. um, <laughs> remember, the bigger one should go at the top. And you say, oh, what if it's 30 of them? So. Let me fix that right away. OK, so and that, by the way, the alignment and size of and stuff is not a C++ thing at all. It is a C thing, OK? It's the nature of the language. It's, uh, it's, the, uh, it's how the language works. So uh, you remember that if I actually wanted to create a student in C language, now I had to actually write over here, if I wanted to create an instance of uh, that, I had to say struct student s, right? And that's painful. So no seasoned C programmer creates a structure like that. What they do is this. Instead of putting the student over here, they just remove that. They write type def. And they write over here, student. So that makes C language work exactly like C++. Because you are saying this type, that is a structure with double yada, 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 is a student. And as of that point, student becomes a new type 
that you have so you don't have to type struct this, struct that, and, and makes your C programming. So if you ever writing a C program for some reason, and you will, you need to uh, actually brings external C programs in your C++, that's your friend not to type too many things. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call this uh, uh, type def in C. Oops, which, how far did I go, anyone? Uh, let, me, let me go all files probably, oh, C++. I went G, right? Okay, I went G. Uh, so I'm gonna go back over here. G, uh, G, so after G is H, right? <laughs> H uh, type def in in C dot, C dot C. Okay, so that's that one. Back to C plus plus. Okay. All right. Next thing we need to know, what we need, next thing that we need to talk about is what we call a void pointer, okay? So I have a question. If I have an integer pointer, P, whatever, and I have a double pointer, Q, what did I do? No. Let me pause recording. So yeah, I have a question. I want you to tell me what is the output of the following program. That's a beautiful thing for the quiz. Okay. So C out size of uh, a, uh, p and. Uh, C out and uh, a little space between the two and size of Q. What is the difference between the size of these two variables? Pardon me? Yes, none. And I have to ask you not to answer the questions anymore because <laughs> the re that, not that why, because, because uh, the, you know your stuff and um, I want other people to actually force them to, to, <laughs> to, to use their minds too. So there is no difference, okay? Addresses all have the same size. It's like an envelope. The size of an address on the envelope is the same for everything. If you send it to a big building or a small house somewhere, the address is the same. It's the target that is different, right? So if I run the program, obviously the answer would be the same for both of them based on your platform. It could be four or four or eight and or eight or eight because we have a 64-bit plat platform. That's why you see eight and eight over there. Each one of them has eight bytes size. Are we okay with this? All right. So, uh, what was the reason? Oh yeah. So, but if I do something like this, if I actually do P plus plus and Q plus plus, you know that's different. If I do something like this. P is going to be added by 4 because the target's size is 4. Uh, and Q is going to be added by 8 because the target size is 8. Are we okay with this thing? Okay. Yes. Pardon me? Yes. I just explained about the envelope and the address. Okay. Uh, back to pointers. P and Q are identical entities. First of all, don't give pointers extra credit. They're just variables. Pointers are variables holding integer values, holding unsigned integer values. Are we all clear about this? When you create a pointer, you are creating a singular integer variable that holds an unsigned integer. What is the difference between a pointer and an integer then? Pointer and an unsigned integer. What is the difference when I tell? Huh? No, they are both unsigned. No. The only difference is that if you add one to an unsigned integer, one will be added. If you add one to a pointer, the size of the target changes. That's the 
only difference. They are both identical things, no difference. Are we clear about this? Okay? <clears throat> because the how big they are, their address in memory doesn't change. They are all the same. Therefore, the size of all pointers are the same. Are we good about this? All right. Now, so, so what I'm saying is that sometimes you want to deal with pure address and nothing but an address. You don't care what is sitting at the target. I want some address in memory. What do I do? That's what we call a void pointer. A void point. Void, you, can, you cannot say void A. It doesn't make sense. Right? You can't say void function, which means this function doesn't return a value, right? But void variable, we can't have. But void pointer, you can. You are saying this pointer is pure address. It doesn't sit. Uh, it doesn't know what's sitting at the target. All right? Now, if I want to write a program to copy a piece of memory from one place to another, what do I have to do? Uh, so remember, I want to get, uh, the class ends at 125, right? Um, do we consider that breaking of the thing, am I recording this? Do we consider that uh, breaking of the, th like the system broke into as a uh, break or you want to get like five, 10 minutes break? Five minutes break? Yay or nay? Who wants to go for a break? Really? Either you are the most dedicated students I've ever seen in my, oh, there. <laughs> are you sacrificing yourself for the greater good? Is that what you're doing? <laughs> so, so, uh, so let's actually have five minutes break. Okay, let's have five minutes break and come back with fresh brains. And at the same time, I'm gonna write program something over here and then we'll talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, let me pause, and you are responsible, sir. <clears throat> so let's say I want to copy a piece of memory from some place to another, regardless of what is sitting at the target. What is the smallest type that we have in C++? It's a character, right? So everything can be broken down into characters. If you have a double, you can bro break it down in four characters, uh, eight characters, right? Eight small pieces of character. And <clears throat> that's how it's going to work. I'll take care of it, don't worry. We should have some kind of a silent sign in the, in the corridors when it's not break down. <laughs> and people are gonna go bananas. Anyway, so what I was saying was, uh, yeah, so here I'm writing a code for that. So I'm saying <coughs> if I have, if I actually want to copy anything from one place to another, regardless of what type of a thing I have, I have to write a program like this. So I say copy memory into a destination that is a character pointer, and then copy it from some source that is a constant character pointer, I don't want to rewrite it, and I have some kind of a size. Size t, you know what is size t. Size t is essentially a, a type that for an unsigned integer that is a standard in C++. When you say size t, it's size of things, okay? So I'm gonna say start from zero, go down to up to size, one by one copy everything from source into destination, regardless of what it is. So if I have an employee, it's gonna go character byte by byte through the employee, do a blind copy from the source into the destination. The example is right there. I have a double over there, and I want to pass the address of the double as a character to be the target. Therefore, I have to cast the double address to a character pointer, correct? To a character address. Then the source should be a constant character address because it's gonna be source. And then I'm going to say it's size of a double. Therefore, it's going to get what starts from the beginning of the source double, whatever it is. Byte by byte, everything's going to get copied from one to another. And when I run it three years later, you will see that the actual value is exactly what I have put over there. You see, one, two, three, four, five, yada, yada, yada. It just rounds it. Okay? <clears throat> so it actually got copied, and it's perfectly good. But as we did it with type def, that we didn't want to repeat this, er, things every single time. If somebody wants to cop, use my code, every single time they want to use this copy mem, they have to keep casting their stuff to a character pointer and a constant character, that's painful. 
right? Instead of doing that, we can do the casting ourselves and instead ask for pure address. Because void pointer is a pure address, you don't need to cast anything to put it in it because it's pure address. If you put the address of an employee into a void pointer, no casting is needed because address of an employee is first of all an address and then the type employee, right? So anything is an address, pure address, and the type is added to it afterwards. Therefore, instead of a character pointer over here, let me just add this one over here and say uh, AFGH, G, I did an H, so this one is an I, <coughs> and I'm going to say over here, uh, copy mem using char, ptr.cpp. Now I can actually change this thing saying, hey, <coughs> I'm not going to leave the burden of casting on other people. I'm going to make this a void pointer, which means because it's void, you can't access the target anymore. The compiler doesn't know what is sitting at the target. It's just an address. It doesn't know what's sitting at a target. And the same thing over here to void, right? But instead, just to make my life easy, so I'm going to call this one v destination and v source. And in here, I'm going to say character pointer destination is set to character pointer cast of v destination. So I do the casting myself over here. And in here, I'm going to say constant character pointer source is set to constant character pointer of the V source. Therefore, now that, <coughs> now that the source over here is pointing to the same place the void pointer is pointing, but looking at it as a character, it can actually go through it. In the good part about it is that I do not need to cast anything here anymore. I simply can say address of this, an address of that. Because the, it's a void pointer sitting over there, any address can be passed to a void pointer without casting. A void pointer is a pure address. Therefore, all addresses can be copied into it without. So it works the exact same way. The only difference is that I put the burden of casting in my code, which is much better. I write it once, everybody can use it thousands of times with no problem. We actually have this thing in one of, I think it's standard library, I think we have this function. But we run it, the outcome is identical to the other one, absolutely no difference, okay? The only difference is that now I'm using void pointers right now. Are we good with this? Do we understand what void pointers are for? Right, when you only need the address <clears throat> and you don't care what is sitting at the target, that's when we deal with void pointers. All right. Or, no, Any, exactly the same thing. Address is address. Hmm? No, nothing is smaller. That type that you see, it's in the compiler dictionary. The fact that you have a double pointer, it doesn't occupy more space. It's just the type of that thing. In the definition of a double pointer, adding one is adding the size. But if you do plus plus for a void, because it doesn't know what is the target, it's going to say, I can't do it. I don't know what's the size of the target to add one to it. Obviously, I could have write this in a nerdish way not to create two extra pointers here and just casted every single thing that I have done over here to a character pointer instead. So <clears throat> instead, of, instead of doing this, I could have casted this that's right over here, so let me write it. So, uh, should I put it in over? Uh, let me just copy it. So instead of doing that, I could just call this one destination and source, <clears throat> and I could bring this casting right down in here. So I could say over here, this is a character pointer. like that, okay? And this one is a <coughs> constant character pointer, like that. That, I didn't need to create extra variables, I could just cast it on the fly. Are we good with this? Are we okay? One? Depends. Um, if you have lots of memory, you don't care about 
like eight extra, 16 extra byte that you wasted in your executable, do the first one. If you're not scared of casting, do the second one. But the first one is potatoes, the second one is potatoes. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Use whatever you want. Or tomatoes and tomatoes. <laughs> Your choice. All right? Good question. Thank you. Okay, so again, compile, make sure nothing is wrong. <clears throat> and there we go. So in here, I'm going to say copy mem. So IJ will be copy mem using void pointers. Not a C++ concept. This is just C. Okay, it has nothing to do with C++. This is basic C language. Okay? So with that primary, primary dependent that has the current, so it's like, okay. One more time, I didn't get the question. So would that try and read any, uh, like, set of memory you can send there? Yeah, exactly. So you can copy, like, if you want to copy a piece of memory from somewhere to another, it yeah. doesn't care what's sitting at. It blindly goes through the number of things and copies them. No, no. It changes the diff. No, changing the type, it overrides the type of the des whatever you have in a destination. Uh -huh. So hopefully, do this. I can say over here, float uh, f set to one two three point four five six, and I have over here uh, a long, and I'm going to put over here l. <clears throat> I can do the exact same thing with these two. So I can actually say address of long, and in here I'm going to put the address of float. And obviously this is going to be size of float, because that's where I'm leading from, right? <clears throat> but when you are printing that L, don't expect that you're going to have some me something meaningful coming up. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I just blindly copied a piece of memory. They happen to be the same size. I'm lucky. Okay? <laughs> But if the right, the left one, like the right one was a double, then you'd be in trouble. You would probably get a segment. Let's do it. You, you would probably <coughs> crash the thing. Let me just see if it's a, uh, Run that on Linux, and uh, you will see. So in here, I'm going to actually do this. <coughs> double is great. Yeah, so I'm, in here, I'm going to say, and I'm going to put over here A. And it's going to be size of a double. Now, if, if, si mm, Short S. Now that's two bytes, I know that for a fact, okay? So I'm gonna put over here S, and now when I print S over here, uh, hopefully it's gonna crash. Uh, uh, go, Windows operating system is a, is, is a crappy operating system. It allows you to do lots of things that you're not supposed to. Do it on Linux or Mac, then you will definitely get a segmentation fault. So run this. There we go. Debug error. Okay, abort. <clears throat> All right, so, uh, so I'm going to say will cause the system to crash. Will cause the system to crash. Or the program, not the system. If you have a good system, only your program is going to crash. <laughs> Let's put it that way. In old times, these things would, would have rebooted your computer. All right, so this one's going to be uh, um, uh, JK uh, copy mem crashing. LCP. All right. <clears throat> Any questions now to this point? I'm sorry, these are boring stuff. As I told you, I'm just filling the gaps, okay? Uh, boring stuff, but... Uh, like next one is actually a C++ topic, so be happy. All right? <clears throat> so um, what is the meaning of L value and R value? We need to understand that, okay? What is the meaning of L value and R value? An L value is what you can put at the left side of an assignment operator. An R value is something that you can only put it at the right side of an assignment operator, okay? An L value can be at left or right. It means you have integer i equals, so have integer i and j, you say i is set to j. These are both L values, and it works perfectly. But if you say integer i is equal to 2, it's set to 2. 
two is an R value. You cannot put it at left side, okay? That's one of the R values that you have. Some of the R values <coughs> are not uh, just literal values, but these R values are things that are not going to exist after your line is executed. And if you've done your OP244 properly, you would remember that if you try and attempt to call a constructor, it will not actually call a constructor, it will cast the argument of the constructor and create a temporary nameless object out of that thing, okay? Honestly, how many people re remember this aspect of, of object orientation? All right. So, uh, yeah, so what is casting in C++? In C++, in C, when you cast, you put stuff in parentheses, right? In C++, the parentheses go around the other thing. Remember that? Why everyone's looking at me as I'm nuts? Okay. <laughs> uh, um, if you... Okay, let's, let's go through this first, and then I'm going to talk about that, okay? Because without that, then our value doesn't make sense at all. I'm like, doesn't mean anything. Okay, so, so <clears throat> this one is returning a value, return 10. So as you see, this is returning 10. This one is returning the reference of tax that is a file scope variable over there. Are we okay with this? Very simple code. This one is returning, it's receiving the reference of A and setting it to a value. So anything you pass to foo, it's going to be two, three, four. Anyone have any problem with these three functions of mine? Okay. So if I say, oh, so I have integer, I have a pointer, I, have an, I set i to six, and I have double t over here, I can say p is address, address of i, therefore p is pointing to i. Now, if I say over here p is equal to address of 76, that doesn't make sense, right? 76 is a literal value. What address? It requires, it requires an L value to be able to extract the address. So the address operator requires an L value. If I, if I left side of this thing, I put the function value and say value is equal to 20, it's not going to work out because value is returning a nameless object that's going to die. Okay? What value is returning? What is value returning? It's returning an integer. Okay, that integer is definitely some variable that someplace is coming out, right? In this case, it's 10 that is coming out. So w value is returning an integer, but that integer is something that is about to die. As soon as it, anything returned by value calls what? OOP244. Any object returned by value will call a? Holy mother, you need to go review your OP244. It calls a copy constructor. Any value that is returned by, anything returned by value is copied. Why is it copied? Why do I need to copy something to return it? Why I don't just return it? Go ahead. It's like I am not allowed to pass that door in any way. And I want to give you a cup of coffee. You're standing at the other side of the the door. I am not allowed to pass anything that believes, I mean quarantine. I'm not allowed to pass anything off that door. And I want to give you a cup of coffee. All I can do, I cannot pass this, is to put this coffee into a disposable cup, pass it to you, you receive it, put it to yourself, throw the cup away. Okay? That is what happens in every single function. We know that any variable within a function dies when the function is over, correct? So how can it be returned? It's impossible. Anything returned by a function is copied into a temporary nameless object, and that temporary nameless object is returned. After that line is over, that temporary nameless object dies. That's what we have from OOP244. Therefore, that integer, that value is returning, is not something that is going to stay alive. It's a temporary thing. Therefore, it's an R value. We cannot put anything in it. 
But if I say tax value is equal to something, I can, because tax value is returning a reference. It's not returning. It's not returning uh, a temporary thing. It's returning an alias. So the function text value becomes alias for the file scope variable tax. And because it's an alias, it's an L value. All right? Remember when we overloaded the uh, index operator? You could put the index operator at the left side only when you return the reference. That's what we need to. Yeah. Okay, so that's that one. <clears throat> you can get the address of tax value because tax value becomes reference alias of tax and therefore the address of that alias is equal to the address of the uh, file scope variable tax. You can pass i to foo because it's returning reference of something, but if you say foo 123, that's not going to work out because a literal value cannot have an alias. It is an L value. Uh, it is an R value. An R value cannot be alias. It doesn't have a name to have an alias. Okay? You need to have a name to have an alias. That's one of the things that, that it, like English language, Perfectly that explains it. To have an alias, you have to have an already existing name. That one, two, three doesn't have a name. Therefore, no alias. Therefore, an R value. Are we good with this? Are we okay one? Are we okay two? So, <clears throat> all right. <sighs> Let me run it, make sure it works. I'm not gonna put over the, the, the compilers. Uh, it's not supposed to print anything, just uh, to give you an error. We'll just walk you through it, right? <clears throat> um, K, uh, JKL, so I'm going to say LVAL and RVAL intro. Well, CPP. <clears throat> that L value and R value is handled perfectly in, in C. You will see it soon. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry. So, how can C know? what the heck is coming in? Is it an R value coming in or it's an L value coming in? The answer is pretty simple. You can actually do it like this. Let's say I want to display an integer. So I'm going to say void display. If I can type it, display integer reference A. Okay? And in here I'm going to say C out. This is an L value. Right? And it's A. Anybody have any, any problem with this beautiful program of mine? Right? Now, the second one that I'm going to do is going to actually receive an R value. How? Like this. I'm going to say display integer A. That means what is receiving is the reference of an R value not a ref, L value. It's something that is about, it's something temporary, something that is about to die. And if I do it like this, I can go R value and put over, oh, 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 oh. So in here, <coughs> I can do this. Integer, I set it, say, to 10, and I can have uh, display I, now in here I'm going to say display, one, two, three, okay? And when I run the program three years later, when it runs, you will see that it's going to tell you the first one is an L value and the right one is an R value. Why do we need this? You'll soon find out. I'm going to give you an introduction to it, okay? <clears throat> When you are returning something by value, that when you are returning something by value, it creates a copy constructor, correct? Right? That copy constructor that is returning copies everything from the other one, whatever that is returning that is just about to die. 
So if I have an employee, let's say I have employee A, and I'm re reading it from a file, and I'm, for some reason I'm returning it by value. So I'm returning an object employee by value in a function. Are we all clear about that? Now doing so, the compiler will create a copy of the employee. And if I have dynamic memory allocation in that one, let's say that employee has several thousands of records attached to it. It's going to make a copy of that thousand records in that temporary name, this one. Then the employee inside the function will die. All the memory will be deallocated. The temporary nameless comes out. The temporary nameless comes out is assigned to something else. All the memory of the temporary nameless is again reallocated in the target and everything, and then it, it's deallocated. So if I have five million records, I need to have 10 million spaces in memory to make this happen because I have to have them both in hand, right? Why do so? Why can't I just move everything that I have in that employee record in a function and move it to the one that I want to copy? I can tell to the nameless copy that is going to get created while returning to take ownership of the data of what is about to die. So I don't have to deallocate it. It's as if I have you got it with everything, so it becomes a, a, a hamburger exactly like mine, and you take it, then I throw my hamburger away. That's crazy. You just have to have an empty plate. I'll move my hamburger from my plate to your plate. Life is beautiful. No hamburger is wasted. Do we understand this? That's called a move constructor. And to be able to move constructor, to be able to actually move something from move co copy, move copy constructor. Now, okay, so what happens is that you can actually tell to the compiler if the object is about to die, move it. Don't, and write another logic in it. So you, instead of just a copy constructor, you create a move copy constructor that instead of copying, takes ownership of the data. You can do the same thing with assignment operator. Assignment operator copies everything, right? But if you are, you are assigning something to, to, to an object to another and the source object is not needed anymore, why duplicate? I can say move assignment. All these things can be detected with those two ampersands over there. Okay? Are we good down to this point? That's the, the why, why we have this? That's why. And remember rule of three? What is rule of three? Oh, I'm going to get you. What is rule of three? Okay. So destructor, copy assignment, and copy constructor, right? Now it's rule of five. Any object that has three sources outside of its scope needs to have five things. The destructor is a destructor, copy constructor, a copy assignment, move construct, move copy constructor, and move assignment. So these two you have to add from now on. Okay? One more time? The condition? Yeah, when you want to lose a hamburger. <laughs> no, whenever you have any object, any class, that has data outside of its scope. Like in a, in, a, in a class, you're opening a file. The file is not inside the class, it's outside, right? Or if you are, uh, you have dynamic memory allocation. That's the perfect example for it, in a class. The information is not in your class, it's outside, right? That's when you need that. The same conditions for rule of three applies for rule of all right. All right. Let me open another cheat sheet. All this boring stuff is going to end, and we're going to come to some nice stuff soon, so don't worry about it. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I have something over here I'm going to put, so instead of all those casts that I have done, you should actually do the, uh, the templated casts 
okay? So when you are actually creating that copy mem thingy that we had, so let me just show it this way before continuing with the rest of this. So this one was, what was it? This was KLM, uh, what do I call it? Uh, yeah, it's cell value and L value and I'm all value continued. Okay. The move thingy that I have written, it's, it's, you should not use that type of cast. You should actually use a constant cast for it like this. You see that? So you have to say static cast, character, yada, static cast, templated type of cast, okay? That uh, enforces type safety. So you're actually telling the compiler what happens. So, so it's a good idea to, to, to have it that way. I'm just gonna copy and paste it over here, so. LMN, uh, uh, so I'm gonna say copy mem uh, with static cast. Static, static cast. So let me see, R value, let value, we talked about it. We talked about that one too. <coughs> oh yeah. Here it comes. So to see actually what L value and R value do in action, let's have a name, okay? And our name over here is, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, our name over here is, uh, has its name in a, um, uh, in a dynamic memory allocate, uh, uh, dynamically allocated memory, and in here, uh, I am setting the M value to null PTR. You know that it just, and, and I'm initializing the value to null. If the name is created just like that, I'm lazy to write, I don't wanna include C string SDR length, so this does, this while loop does SDR length for me. And uh, this does the dynamic memory allocation. And this one is a string copy, okay? So these are done in just loops, okay? If you don't know how it works, go walk through it, okay? These are just, uh, uh, this is just a while loop and a for loop, but written in a proper way, okay? So, <clears throat> and the copy constructor, we've already known how it works, so it works the exact same way like the other one, you just copy everything from the, uh, from the, uh, the, 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 the source to the current object, and I have an O stream print over here that prints the, the value of the name, <clears throat> if the value is not null, and I have a destructor that is destroyed the name, so essentially I created a dynamic name. Simple, straightforward, in a better C++ way with no C strings uh, used. Are we okay with this? All right, so go through it and see how, how what, what do I mean when I say this is string copy, okay? See how it works. So it kind of does backwards, but it's okay. Then I overload the, uh, the insertion and extraction operator to print it, with an L value and R value, so we can see that. So in here I'm saying print name and I'm passing a reference, okay, so to just have a function to test it. <coughs> okay, <laughs> I'm asking over here, what is called? So tell me in line 54, what do I call in line 54? What is called in line 54? Assignment operator or copy constructor? Assignment operator or copy constructor? How many people think it's copy constructor that is called at line 54? Don't change it, you, you're right at the beginning. It's copy constructor. Assignment at the moment of creation is always copy, there is no, there is no assignment operator. Assignment operator only is called when it's out there. At the moment of creation, that's initialization. And initialization means calling a constructor, right? And because it's being initialized to an object of the same type, by definition, it's copy constructor. Remember, assignment at the moment of creation, it's not an assignment operator, it is initialization. And because of that, so what is it called? A constructor. What type of a constructor? A copy constructor because of that, okay? <clears throat> so how about this one? I have over here name C, and I'm saying name A, B, C, D. So what happens with that one? 
at right side of that assignment operator, a temporary nameless name is created. You cannot call a constructor. That's the rule. So when you are calling what it looks like calling a constructor is actually a C++ cast. So you are casting ABCD to a name. Constructors cannot be called. And how does C++ cast? It creates a temporary nameless object out of what you provide for it. That's the cast. So at right side, I have a temporary nameless object. Now I want to copy it into C. OK? C++ says, you give me an R value, I'll never copy it. An R value is never copied. It's always replaced by changing ownership. So essentially it says, why do I copy this nameless into C? I'm just going to call this nameless C, right? That's part of this, the, the compiler that actually takes care of that. It's the same exact, so this is exactly this. Line 59 and line 54 are identical things. They are not two different things. One is done to a name, the other one is done to a double. Are we okay with this? Any hesitation? Doubt? Anybody wants to drop three, four, five at the moment? No? <laughs> no? All right. Okay, so <clears throat> the first one that I'm actually passing, I'm calling print name, and the second one I'm calling print name like this, as you see. Okay? So when I do something like that, you will see over here that a problem is there. Okay? Initial value to reference to a non-const must be an L value. And I have an R value over there. All right? Okay. But, okay, so let me run it. So print name is not going to work in here. I'm just going to comment it. Okay? Now I'm going to come over here. I am saying C out, and I'm putting a tempor temporary nameless object over here, and I'm going to put over here name C out. So I'm going to go C out A, and I'm going to go C out name Joe. Okay? When I run it, for the first one, let me just put a stop sign over here and a run and get to it. Uh oh Yes, it means the end of the class. Okay, so as soon as I come over here, when I go press F11, it's going to step into. It comes up right, right over here, and it's an L value because I'm receiving a reference over here. Okay? So it actually prints that one out. But in here, when I'm calling name Joe, it's going to go create a nameless Joe, of course. And then after that, the one with an R value is called because I put double reference over there. Okay? Because it's a, if it was OOP244, then we'd have been in prop, 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 blah, we'll go, would, we would have been in trouble here. Now we are not. Now we can actually overload our operators and our functions to detect if something that is coming in is an R value or not. All these things now can be detected and Act accordingly for it, okay? That's the end of today. So this one is going to be, again, M value and R value continue, L, M, N, and that's O. And that's the end of today. Uh, we will see you the next time you're coming in. Tomorrow I'll try to make myself available. I have some 